All right, hello people. Sorry for the delay. Welcome to this surprise stream. I'm, of course, your host, Lu Sensei, and welcome. Now, I do apologize if you can't see me right now. I'm actually right here. I know it may look like an empty room, but I'm actually here. So today we have a special uh, discussion. Now I will be doing my special uh, Q and A session, the uh, Ask Me Anything AMA thing, in around uh, ten or nine and a half hours time. So it's twelve thirty past midnight here right now. So I'm a little groggy, kind of. Uh, I'm on a sugar high, but apart from that, I'm pretty normal. Um, but I will be doing the AMA in approximately uh, nine hours. So um, that's what I've been kind of holding out for. But I thought for those who couldn't make that time slot because Australia is very strange in terms of its placement in the future. Um, I want to do a, a quick live stream now covering a quick topic and then I'll take questions at the end for those who want to hang around. So the topic that I'm covering today is the topic of camouflage in archery. Um, I have covered this before. Uh, the video is the um, well, camouflage clothing video. That's no surprise. But uh, that was quite a few years back. And uh, the comments in that video have been quite interesting. Because for some reason, a lot of people feel that their liberties are being attacked by this rule about not having camouflage. And people are very passionate about camouflage. I mean, I'm not one to speak, but man, it's like, oh, I, I want to wear denim jeans, I want to wear camouflage, and if, I, if I'm not allowed to wear camouflage, and I'm not going there. It's a strange thing, um, but I just want to clarify a few things. So, what I want to do is to go through the rules which specify what you can and can't wear, what camouflage actually is, and where does this would actually apply. So um, this first 15 or so minutes, 20 or so minutes, we'll go through the rules. This will be a lot of rule book kind of look here, um, just to see exactly where it comes from. Um, and uh, if you want to stop at around 20 minutes, then that will be the end of the full presentation. Um, but the... Um, the rest of the video, which might take another 20 minutes afterwards, will be the uh, Q&A. So uh, I want to flip over quickly to uh, what I've got uh, over here. So um, I'm going to firstly show you the base of the rules which I'm talking about. Um, and I'll take questions a bit later. So let's flip over to our browser. So this is the World Archery Rules, and the rule book specifies what archers can and can't do. Now, before I do anything, I want to clarify something that a lot of people seem to misunderstand. The World Archery Rules only apply to World Archery events. Now, this is something which is unlike other sports. I've, I've come to understand why people get so caught up about this rule set and why they think that their freedom to wear whatever they want is banned. Unlike in many other sports, World Archery, which is the International the World Archery Federation, does not prescribe the rules for or the laws for sport in every level. This is different to something like, say, in uh, soccer or football, where you have FIFA. FIFA is the International Federation for Football. And what they do with the rules, basically, is um, law for every national organization so let's say um uh fifa decides that um goalkeepers are now allowed to uh, pick up the ball from a back pass so that, that used to be a rule change um keepers could uh pick up the ball from a back pass but um they changed so that they couldn't just to keep the flow of play going and rules don't change that much in fifa but fifa made a new rule where yes uh, they can do so um and that means that basically every other 
um, continental federation and uh, national association have to use the same rule. You can't have like the European um, football federations having one set of rules and the Ocean and federation having a different set of rules. They have to be unified. So FIFA basically outlines um, the rules. Uh, same with things like cricket. If the ICC decide to change a rule in cricket, then these things must be in place in every federation. There are some exceptions, but that's generally how it works. In um, archery, world archery does not dictate the rules for international or for, for national federations or national associations. So if World Archery says this thing, then Archery USA doesn't have to follow it. Archery Australia doesn't have to follow it. In fact, every country has their own association with their own rule set. And I don't think there are any countries which say refer to World Archery. Because World Archery only has jurisdiction, I guess you can call it, over their own events. And there are a limited number of events where these rules strictly apply. So when I read these rules, don't feel that yeah, oh, Australia is just a crappy place because the ban guns and other ban camo. No, it's actually not a national rule. This is just the international competition rules. And in fact, what we'll see later on is a clarification on where these rules actually apply. So when I read these rules out and discuss them, don't feel like this applies to you. What you do at your club or at your state level or national level may be different depending on what your own rule set says about clothing. So let's talk through the rules. Okay, so the first thing we're looking at is the World Archery target rules. There's target archery, which is what you see on the TV, which is basically two people shooting a target, and then there's other forms of uh, archery as well. Now, the rule for target archery is in 11.3, and specifically it is 11.3.3. Athlete equipment should not include camouflage colors of any kind. Now, this thing here, sorry, the camouflage colors is something, whoops, I did not mean to do that. Um, the camouflage colors thing is going to be a little contentious. And in fact, there was a clarification which I mentioned later on. But the ruling is that it cannot include camouflage colors of any kind. Now, the second relevant thing is, but we'll go to uh dress regulations in chapter 20 and i think it'll roughly say the same sort of thing here um i'll just do a quick search camouflage so in uh section 20 uh of book 3 section 20 um no denim or jeans regardless of the color of the color or camouflage okay so no denim jeans regardless of the color or camouflage clothes and equipment may be worn nor any oversized or baggy type pants or shorts and that's the int that's the international ruling the world archery ruling so you can't wear denim or jeans no matter what color and you can't wear oversized baggy type pants or shorts so you can't have that ghetto look um and no camouflage if you skip down to the other discipline of archery, field in 3D, which is in book 4, that is also covered in dress regulations here. So it's a much shorter section, but uh, it's quite important to note that clothing and equipment should not be camouflage. No oversized or baggy type trousers are allowed. So that's the ruling. So, so far, so good, right? Any, any quick questions? Okay, uh, quick question, do I go hunting? No, I personally don't go hunting. But nonetheless, we go back to uh, the uh, original rule set. So that's the World Archery official book. Now, something to keep in mind with World Archery is sometimes the, the National Archery Federations will uh, have clarifications. They'll submit questions to the Rules Committee and they will determine what uh, the ruling is. You can find that in the interpretations link on the rules page and it's sorted by year. Now I've looked at the last um, two or uh, look the last four years I guess so from these two folders it doesn't really have much in the previous folders but if you go to 2015 to 2017 you see there are some clarification of things like cam and definition of camouflage. So we'll go through some of these rules. So the first rules that we'll go to is clothing rules 
at events. Book 3, Article 20, Dress Regulations, we just read that. So World Archery Norway has requested an interpretation of the applicability of the dress rule set forth in Book 3, Article 20. In fact, I've got a second thing right here. This is the camouflage clothing rule and the clothing rules in general. But the, I'll, I'll go through this first to clarify, as I said before, exactly where this rule applies. So for those of us who really want to wear camouflage to your club, just pay attention to this. So, uh, this is the ruling from the Rules Committee. It is the opinion of the CNR, which is the uh, Constitution and Rules Committee, the dress rule set forth in Book 3, Article 20 apply at the following events. Competition for World and Continental titles, competition for Olympic and Paralympic titles, which may be more restrictive than World Archery Clothing Rules, which is true. The Olympic Games have more restrictions. One of the more notable restrictions in this regard, which, this, which shouldn't surprise you, are sponsors. So, at, if you're shooting at a World Archery event, then you're not bound by contracts which say um, you can't show certain sponsor logos. So, if you're a sponsored shooter and you have sponsored branding on your uh, uniform or your jersey, then you're allowed to wear that in the warm-up, in the practice, in the qualification, um, and so on. In fact, in the qualification, you don't have to wear a national uniform. Um, the national uniform only applies to the finals, which are televised. The, uh, these, the ranking rounds and practice rounds are not televised, so you see people wear their normal shooting gear, whether it's you know denim jeans or a t-shirt or a sponsored shooting jersey. But at the Olympics, because there's more corporate sponsorship, then you can't display uh, sponsors that aren't official sponsors of Olympic Games. So that's why it's a nice clarification here. So back to the rule set. Um, competition at Outdoor World Cups, competition for Outdoor World Ranking, and archery event of major event organizations, any international multi-sport organization that acts as the ruling body for any continental, regional, or other international event. And this may be things like the uh, Commonwealth Games, it may be like the Pan Pacifics, or the Masters Games, or the World Games, so any international sporting um, organization, apart from the Olympic Games, that hosts an archery event, um, they would have to follow these clothing rules. So that, uh, apart from that, provided that such dress rules do not apply at events which are organized at the member association or lower level, in which case the applicable member association's dress rules should apply, or indoor World Cup events, except to the extent that World Archery Executive Board otherwise determines appropriate. Uh, so again, so if you are shooting at a national level or state level or lower, then the World Archery rules do not apply. It's only for the World Archery events specified in this section here. So, if your national association has a rule on camouflage, then that rule takes priority. Not the World Archery rule, the national rule or the state rule, whatever it is. So, if your state has a different uh, camouflage rule to a different state, then that might apply. But depends on how um, which which rule set takes take, takes priority and in most cases the national rule set because all the state associations are typically affiliates of the national association uh, depending on the history of archery in your country but um, normally there's a specific rule which says you can do this but typically whatever level you compete at that's the rule set you use okay uh, so that is the clothing rule so uh, the clothing rules only apply in these events this section here is a later one from 2016. This uh, covers the camouflage clothing specifically, but it's the same uh, ruling here. So Archery Canada uh, requested this clarification on camouflage clothing. I think that's what I said in the... Uh, unfortunately, the documentation only contains the ruling. It doesn't contain the um, diagrams and uh, attachments, which are normally part of the process. But um, this is 11.3.3. That is the rule we had before in this section here from the rule set. So book three, uh, target archery, uh, athletic commit 11.3.3. So before was book 20, dress regulations. This is 11.3.3, which is this one comment. Um, athletic equipment should not include camouflage colors of any kind. So the ruling here, 
is that the uh, camouflage colors, as provided in Book 3, Article 1133, apply to the following events. Competition for World of Continental Titles, Competition for Olympic and Paralympic Titles, Competition for World Ranking, Olympic and Paralympic Coliculture Events, um, uh, Archery Events of Major Organizations, Indoor Outdoor World Cups, and any other event for which World Archery is the ruling body or point technical officials. That's basically the same thing we just saw before. So, again, to clarify, if World Archery sanctions or organizes this event, then it follows World Archery rules. Um, if it's not a World Archery event, then these rules won't necessarily apply to you. So we'll go through one more clarification of this rule, and that is from this. This is a much, much bigger one from the Archery Association of, of Namibia. And this is a very good one. This is why I, I wish I had the images to attach, but it doesn't provide it in the, um, the directory. But this is a really, really good um, clarification because what exactly is camouflage? And this is a point of contention. So camouflage, you might have recognized this. This is camouflage. This is um, Auscam, Australian camouflage. Um, you might see Flechtan, which is the uh, German camouflage, a spot spluggy one. You might have the woodland camouflage used in America. There's all these forms of camouflage. So uh, what if I wore this? in bright pink and purple. Would that be camouflage? And since the rule mentions camouflage colors, what if I wore a plain olive t-shirt? Is that a camouflage color? So the rules need to specify whether camouflage colors refers to the color that is used in camouflage or the patterns used in camouflage. And I think that is a very fair line to draw. So this clarification is going to talk through uh, what the World Federation, the World Archery Federation, determines to be camouflage. I want to highlight that this is only world archery. At national or lower level, it depends on what the National Association, the State Association, refers to as camouflage. And more importantly, it depends on how the judge on the day considers camouflage. I might share some anecdotes a bit later, but we'll talk through the rule set now. So, this is the clarification put forward by the uh, Committee and Rules, the, the, the Constitution and Rules Committee, about the question on uh, whether, uh, well, what is camouflage? So, the question is um, whether all target bows must have a solid color, so a single solid color on the riser to avoid containing camouflage, um, and to the bow shown below. Uh, there's no bow in, there's no picture here, so I can't show you what it is. I do want to, just, just while we're looking at this, I'm going to uh, briefly look something up. So just keep chatting for a bit, ask questions for a moment, because I want to show you something that, um, this is part of the anecdote, which I want to discuss in a moment here. Um, there's a bow I want to show. I think it's the... I... Okay, all right, I, I, let, let's take this one. This it wasn't exactly what I was thinking of. So I'm going to check this out. So look over here. This is a, a Hoyt compound bow. And Hoyt have a bow um, color scheme called Fusion. And Fusion is a lightning bolt design. It comes in normally comes in red Fusion and blue Fusion, often on the recurve risers as well as compound bows. And admittedly, it's a pretty cool color design. Honestly, this is nice. I like the look of it. But is this camouflage? I want to examine this for a moment here. This is like a classroom test. Is this camouflage? Now, I, I'm telling you, it's a lightning bolt design. It's got sparks and lightning bolts. The whole point of the fusion thing is electricity. Now, the anecdote which I've heard is that somebody using a red Hoyt fusion design uh, had been called up by the judge, um, and the judge said, this is a camouflage design. Uh, I'm not sure what the exact wording is, but the, the judge ruled this is camouflage and the competitor protested because this is a commercially available bow. This is not an aftermarket uh, application. This isn't something which the archer painted on himself. This is the bow as bought straight off the shelf. 
So if a bow that is in this form, sold specifically for target archery, is considered to be camouflaged, then something's horribly wrong here. And I think he eventually did get into competition after a lot of haranguing with the judge about the interpretation of the rules. But this one mean by the judge is the one who determines that. If there are problems with that, it must go through a process where it must be determined. But the question that was clarified by Archery um, Namibia was this. Is this a camouflage bow? Does it have to be a single solid color? So what is the discussion? The discussion is as follows. So uh, it is determined, uh, or this this is the ruling on this one. Um, oh, before that, this this is for the uh, another. Um, uh, it, there are two uh, requests here. It covers eleven thirty three twenty one one and thirty three one. Well, so Namibia asked this, and the National and Judges Committee of Real Federación Española de Tiro de Arco, so Tiro con Arco. The, basically the Spanish Archery Association or the Judges Committee of the um, Spanish Archery Federation uh, as a request interpretation on whether the requirement that athletic equipment should not include camouflage colors of any kind, applies to bows, quivers, arrows, accessories such as backpacks, gloves, etc. and what constitutes camouflage colors. That's a very very good question. What the heck is camouflage? So this is the response. So, um, Book 3, Chapter 3, 11, 1, 3 provides that athletic equipment should not include camouflage colors of any kind. While read literally, this could be construed as restricting any colors that are used in traditional camouflage. That's a nice term, traditional camouflage. Not modern designs, but traditional camouflage. Even though not used in a camouflage pattern. For example, green, brown, black, tan, and white are uh, often seen used in camouflage patterns. Construed in this manner, this would prohibit all equipment which is solid green, brown, tan, etc. This is not the intent of the bylaw. Alright, so I'm going to emphasize that again. So according to the clarification put forward by World Archery and the, the Constitution Rules Committee, a traditional camouflage color such as anything i'm wearing right here green brown tan white black that alone would not constitute camouflage even though they are used in camouflage by themselves as a solid color they would not be considered camouflage i'm not questioning the rule i'm just explaining it if you have problems with it just feel free to chat away i'm just interpreting the rule as it's in front of me now the other part is however other colors that are not traditionally used in camouflage, such as pink, blue, and bright yellow, could be used in a camouflage pattern. The intent of the bylaw is to restrict the use of equipment with a camouflage pattern. That is what the rule says. It's not the camouflage color, which is what the actual rule says, but the intent of the rules and the bylaw is to prevent camouflage patterns not colors you can wear a green shirt or use a green bow but you can't have it in a camouflage pattern so no pink camouflage bows and you can't get them by the way likewise the intent of the bylaw is not to restrict abstract designs or multi colors whether random or otherwise which are not camouflage patterns hence this bow the uh, the fusion paint job on the hoyt is not considered camouflage according to World Archery. Again, World Archery, not Archery USA or Archery Australia or Archery GB. World Archery does not consider this to be camouflage. This is an abstract design. It is artistic. It is not meant to be camouflage. That is the intention. Um, rather, the intent of the bylaw, and this is really important for those who keep on asking, the intent of the bylaw is to restrict the use of camouflage patterns regardless of the color. So, color, um, the, accordingly, the term camouflage colors is hereby construed as follows. Camouflage colors are trademarked or other digital designs, whether random or not, and regardless of colors used, which consist of natural material camouflage patterns such as bark, twigs, or leaves, or leaves that are used for the purpose for, of blending in with natural environments, thereby providing less visibility to game, military personnel, or others. 
that's a nice definition of camouflage and the rules it doesn't have this but i'm glad that this has been specified for this so regardless of color um it's meant to basically it basically covers any pattern um such as not limited to but such as bark twigs or leaves for the purpose of blending in with natural environments and providing less visibility non-traditional camouflage colors such as pinks blues bright yellow etc and camouflage patterns that are used in designs for the purpose of blending with natural environments whereby less uh, providing less visibility are considered camouflage Wow. Okay, that'd be. A, I think this will cause some controversy with the comments here, but let's let's go through that again. So, it is it, what is considered camouflage to world archery is that the material and pattern is intended to disrupt the pattern of the wearer and to help them blend in with a natural environment. The color doesn't matter. The pattern does. So while a bright pink and blue and yellow camouflage shirt or jacket may not help you blend in a forest environment, the pattern does. That is the line drawn by the rules committee at World Archery. The color is okay, the pattern is not. So it doesn't exactly um, follow the rule set intuitively, but the clarification here is that this is the way it should be read. The intent is the pattern is camouflage, not the color. Uh, just going through the rest of the, uh, the clarification. No part of any equipment can have camouflage patterns. That includes the bow, that includes your um, scope, that includes your hat, that includes your lanyard or strap or some tape. Nothing on your equipment can be camouflage. That's actually a rule been set in place quite a while ago. So, um, applying the above analysis to the question to ask by Archery Association Namibia, equipment does not have to be a solid color. So you can have multicolor designs, as we saw before uh, on the uh, Hoyt Fusion uh, paint job. That, sh in my understanding, is legal according to World Archery, and there's no reason why it shouldn't be. Sorry. Uh, it appears from the picture below that the bow is shown as camouflage patterns and therefore is not permitted to build a type of there without such portions having the privilege design to being taped up. There's no picture. I imagine it might be I don't know, some you know, bright pink co co compound bow with camouflage. I don't know. But if you have a camouflage bow, then you have to tape over it for it to be used legally at a World Archery event. And again, World Archery event. The restriction applies to athlete equipment. The initial sentence of Book 3 provides that this article lays down the type of equipment athletes are permitted to use when shooting in world archery competitions. Accordingly, for this purpose, athlete equipment consists of all equipment used by an athlete in connection with competing, including, without limitation, anything used, worn, or taken by the athlete on the field of play. Because like technically, if you have like a camouflage bow stand, then that also is covered by this rule. Equipment includes, but is not limited to, the bow, quiver, arrows, and accessories such as backpacks and gloves. And that's in 2016, the pretty recent ruling. That is perhaps the most specific clarification we have on the world archery side. Now there is one more thing that I want to show you. Now bear in mind that World Archery is not the only international archery federation. There are others. The one I'm referring to next is the IFAA or the International Federation. Sorry, the International Field Archery Association, um, and field, they cover field archery and 3D archery, where camouflage is a bit more prevalent. So let's go through their rule book. And in fact, they don't really have a lot of rules. They misspell it. So it's actually like cameo. <laughs> All right. So um, because this form of archery is more literally beating around the bush, um, it's more common to see camouflage clothing in field and 3D because you're in you're in a natural environment. So the rules for the IFAA state as follows. 
Competitors are strongly advised to wear bright clothing on the ranges, especially in conditions with poor visibility. And remember, field archery is basically in the woods. So as with a lot of things like, for example, hunting, you don't have to wear camouflage, you don't have to wear bright clothing, but it's generally really a good idea so people can see you. Because especially the courses may be constructed in a way where you can't easily spot other people. So they are not required to, but are strongly advised to wear bright clothing on the range, especially in poor visibility. Full camel clothing would not be allowed on the ranges without a high visibility item. That's a very clear statement. So you, from this rule, from the IFAA, you are allowed to wear camouflage, but you can't wear full camouflage without some kind of high visibility item. So if you're wearing, say, a team jersey and um, camouflage trousers, then that should be okay. But if you're wearing a full set of, you know, combat fatigues, you need a high visibility vest or something. So you can't just wear full camo and walk around shooting um, a field round in the woods. Um, in, in my, this is where things get a little interesting. For, I mean, for world archery, where you're shooting at a, a venue specifically for archery. There's no practicality. If you're doing field or 3D, when you're in the woods, it is a safety issue because there are people who are on the course who you might not see, and that might be a risk to the user, so or, or the, the 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 participants. In world archery, where it's a target event, you're not trying to be practical because everyone can see you. It's more of an image thing. Now, there are other things I've heard of. I've heard that in some countries, camouflage is more restricted for civilian use. So, um, world archery, you know, the rather than make exceptions for sport and try to change the law, they say, well, at this level, you can't wear camouflage. But basically, um, it's an, it is an image thing. Uh, for more practical archery, like field or 3D, um, where there is a strong hunting connection, there is a, a more um, a, a more natural, practical purpose. Then there are less strict rules on the camouflage. But for the specific sporting form of archery, then the camouflage rules are very clear and very strict at world archery level. And again, world archery level, not state or national. That depends on your own rules. But at World Archery, the stuff you see at the Olympic Games, at the World Championships, they don't want to portray a militaristic image to the masses. Um, so that that's something which, if you agree or not, feel free to discuss below in the comments or in chat right now from the live stream. Um, but that is my understanding of what the rules are there for, and that is the interpretation of the camouflage rule in both the International Field Archery Association, which is the one of the larger um, field archery um, organizations, and the World Archery Federation. So that's the clarification. So uh, I will be having a quick read through the questions. Feel free to ask now if you haven't asked me already. Tag my name, use um, hashtag or at new sensei so I can see my name and see the questions. Otherwise, I might miss the original thing. So I'm gonna go to the very top of the uh, the chat. I'm gonna quickly uh, flip through. And uh, by the way, like I said before, um, I'm doing my official 50,000 sub AMA in around nine hours, approximately eight hours, 50 minutes. I need some sleep then, holy crap. Um, but yeah, for those who are in Europe, this is the prime time for you, I guess. Uh, if you're gonna ask me anything now, it's a good, qu it's a good chance to do so. Um, I hit 50,000 subscribers, that, that's a pretty good milestone. Um, but more, like, the, the, it actually brought the visibility of my channel and the sport of archery by a lot. Uh, it's mostly due to the um, Why Do Olympic Archers Swing Their Bows video, which went um, on the trending list on YouTube. Um, for once, I'll say the YouTube algorithm is pretty cool. Um, everything else is broken, but that, that one thing worked. I mean, one point, I think it's like 1.4 million views now. Uh, and that means a lot of people who never do archery now know something 
something about archery. That's a very good goal to have. Um, it's definitely something like you know going viral without doing a Lars Anderson is pretty cool. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even intend to make that to be a good video. That was literally the first thing I shot with my new microphone and my new camera. I didn't figure out the settings yet, so uh, it was unscripted, unprepared. Uh, it was just a camera test, and it, it was a really good one. People loved it, so. Um, that that injected like twenty thousand extra views in the channel, so uh, I'm I'm on track for my silver play button fairly soon. I believe uh, mid February is the current estimation, assuming I don't um, spike again in the uh, the list. Okay, so let's go through some of these questions. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I mentioned before uh, War Thunder French tanks. I knew it was going to come when they made the major French. Um, uh, uh, aircraft tech tree. I knew that um, tanks would come sooner or later, and they're doing it pretty quickly. Um, I received notice from the um, the devs that um, they're starting up. They're doing a very similar uh, closed beta, like they did with the planes. Um, of course, as uh, you know, War Thunder partner, I'll get early access to the tanks. And uh, and because I've reached fifty thousand, I'm I'm actually at the next tier of the um, the War Thunder media partners. Yeah, it starts out like you can you can um, sign up if you have like I think like fifteen hundred subscribers. Once you reach ten thousand, you have certain you have access to certain vehicles and you can ask for free stuff. At twenty, I think fifty thousand is the next one for YouTubers, and I've clearly uh, exceeded that. Um, Let's see. Uh, John Lee, I heard about a controversial ring where target competition about had a sporty pattern. Yeah, I mentioned that before. Uh, a sport, a sporty pattern. That was, uh, I think, the Hoyt Fusion design, which I referenced before. Um, Wolfpack138. Uh, would like to compete in Olympic archery. Where do I start to compete for my first time? I'm in Michigan, USA. Uh, look for your nearest archery club, especially one which is affiliated with Archery USA. Um, the pathway, because the like, archery competition in the USA is a bit different from the rest of the world, uh, typically. Uh, depends on where you are. Because archery competition is mostly amateur. Um, that's the same for most sports. You don't see an independent archery circuit. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are private competitions which are open entry. For example, the Vegas shoot. Vegas is, is, is the biggest archery competition possibly in the world. Like it might you know, like rival that of world archery because world archery it's a professional competition, whereas Vegas is open entry. You pay the entry fee, the you get prize money, so it's absolutely huge. A lot of the best archers will compete at Vegas, but they're not necessarily the competitive professional archers. Um, same with things like the Lancaster Classic, um, and there are others too. But yeah, um, you, you can compete in any archery event. Uh, Assuming you you have fulfilled their uh, eligibility rules, but for if you're trying to compete for national team spots, you need to go through Archery USA um, and their system. So look at your nearest club, uh, compete in your nearest club. Look for ranking events, national ranking events, or qualification events. Every country does it slightly differently, so look it up. But uh, Archery USA will be the place to go to for you. Check out their website and how to become an archer through their system. Uh, good question, though. Okay. Uh, Lucas the Us, so I'm late. Is there a reason why cameras disallowed? Um, just to quickly summarize. Um, yeah, it's mostly uh, for field archery, it's a safety thing. For um, competitive target archery, it's an image thing, mostly. Mm. The Hoyt Vantage, I, I showed it, yes. Uh, Dell, can I use Tiger Stripe Veins? In a club, sure. Uh, in a field around, sure. That's no problem with that. Um, I believe at world archery level, according to the rules, a tiger stripe would be considered to be a camouflage design. I'm not the official in charge. I can't verify for sure. But to my interpretation, a tiger stripe would be actually. I didn't even mention it because like yeah, it, it, a tiger stripe, you can have like bright orange fluoro tiger stripe. And a tiger stripe does not meet the clarification here, but it depends on the intent. Okay, I, like if I draw a squiggly black line on a piece of paper, and I draw like three of them, it's that camouflage. I I'm gonna say that look, nobody at World Archer uses um, at that level uses tiger stripe anyway. It's kind of cheesy to use, but could you? Um, I, actually, no, I was gonna say yes, it's camouflage, but. 
like I'm thinking of a tiger stripe camouflage uniform, um, like what we saw like in the um the uh, the uh, the army, the army of the Republic of Vietnam, the South Vietnamese army, the, their rangers and their their army uses tiger stripe, very very well known. Um, a tiger stripe camouflage uniform, yeah, definitely, it's it's a, it's a uniform, but a tiger stripe pattern. Um, I don't. I, I in my opinion. If I was an official, I wouldn't ping a tiger stripe design as camouflage because it's an artistic design, similar to the fusion paint job on the um, risers. I think having artistic or abstract design on tiger stripe isn't camouflage. I think the veins. I mean, camouflage veins. You don't find camouflage veins. You can find pattern veins, but camouflage veins. I don't think that's going to be an issue. But I'm not the word archery judge. So that's actually a good question, though. Uh, I didn't think about that. No, yeah, good question, though. I didn't think about that. Um, my, my like I said, my first reaction was yes, it's definitely. Hang on, maybe not because it's abstract. So it uh, could be clarification in the future, but I don't think anyone will kind of bring um, tiger veins to the uh, World Archery Championships. Mostly because like most people use like spin wings of some sort, so you don't find them in camouflage. But a uh, very very good question. Um, Alex Noodles, New Year, would you recommend very new archers to incorporate stabilizers ASAP? Um, okay, uh, if you are shooting, okay, if this is your very, 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 very first time in archery, then no, shoot, uh, shoot the most simple bow possible. But if you have your own bow and you are going into practicing a freestyle classification of archery then i recommend you put stabilizers sooner rather than later i don't believe in the progression uh, ideology or mentality where first you master bare bow then you master using a sight then you master using sight and stabilizers i think that's a very protracted way of doing archery if you intend to shoot in open freestyle then put sight and stabilizers soon uh, ASAP, yeah, as soon as possible. I, I, I would agree as soon as possible because the sooner you learn with the proper tools and equipment, the faster you learn. The, the thing that's contentious is the clicker. A lot of people say don't use it because it causes more trouble than it's worth. I'm of the opinion that the clicker should be used as a training tool and that will help you gain a consistent draw length. So in my opinion, if you intend to shoot in the freestyle division of sporting target archery, then the sooner you get used to the full equipment, the faster you will learn. Now, if you're talking about archery in general, then no, like shoot without stabilizers and sights. Enjoy archery for what it's worth. And if you don't want to shoot that sort of style, then don't use these things. But if you intend to shoot this style, then put it on sooner. That's my opinion. Hmm. All right. Uh, some people are talking about the colors, which I mentioned before. I'll pass it on. And again, tag my name for the questions. I'm going to uh, skip to the bottom, I think. <laughs> Sebastian P. R. Ginter. Uh, yes, the next Darwin Award will be going to people shooting in in the forest in full camo. <laughs> That's yeah. There's there's something silly about that. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Samna Flynn, um, petition idea, Lars Anderson should, should wear camouflage and don't deceive anymore. <laughs> I love these uh, Lars memes and um, camouflage memes put together, that's, that's quite funny. I, I know, I, 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 I'm, it's hard to make a live stream about someone mentioning Lars in some way, right? Now, even, even the, the, the second line in the chat is like Lars, talk about Lars. Um, I, I, I have no intention of talking about the Lars' like, most recent videos because he's, he's doing his thing. I'm not going to comment on everything he does. People, one, people hate it. It's kind of like, oh, why do you talk about Lars so much? You, know, you must hate Lars, you're so jealous. Look, I'm not going to play the trolls, right? I, I, if, if Lars is doing something which is cool, like trick shooting, that's fine. I'm not going to comment on trick shooting. Um, I, I do want to talk about um, bending the arrow because there's a misconception. Now, this isn't Lars' fault necessarily. It's more about the viewers misconstruing what is being presented. Um, you can't actually 
shoot an arrow around a corner. This isn't like um, Assassin's Creed Origins. Um, the, what, what Lars does is he has... Uh, it's a technique which is you can learn. Um, Lars mentioned it. Uh, Maltese Archery, the, the different, different archery channel, has taught you how to do it. I actually want to do it myself. The problem is that I don't have the right equipment for it right now. I'm getting it ordered in. Um, but it's, bending an arrow is not a difficult thing to do. It just requires experimentation. But people are misunderstanding what it's used for. It is a trick shot. And I'm not, say, I'm not saying this in a disparaging way where, oh, it's a crappy thing that... Um, only noobs do and it's, there's no purpose it's meant to impress people by shooting around an object but not bend around an object and this is what i mean the way it works is that let's say right, i'm, I'm going to demonstrate this uh, virtually and this is for, for the sake of discussion okay let's say this camera i'm pointing at you are the target and i have an object in the way let's say this microphone is the object so i did not have a direct line of sight sight to you, because this, I have to shoot the arrow at you, I have to go through this microphone. So the idea of what Lars Anderson presented, the idea of bending the arrow, is that I shoot the arrow around this obstacle and then hit you. That's what he's presenting. He can't control the flight of the arrow, okay? So I, I can't make the arrow go... Um, over here, then here, then here. This isn't, again, the, the Predator bow from uh, Assassin's Creed uh, um, uh, Origins. So I can't control where the arrow will bend. Now, if you are well versed enough, and you have the right arrow and the right finger placement, you could determine how far it will bend around. But I can't bend it around a corner. I can make the arrow hit this camera where you are by bending it around an object. But if I'm facing this way and you're over there, I can't make the arrow go zip zip in a 90 degree fashion. That's not how it works. Um, it's He did have a trick where he shot like around, literally like 180 degrees around a corner. But that's, uh, as he mentioned, something which requires a modified arrow. You need um, a front set, uh, you know, very broad tip. You need a you know, like an extra set of um, uh, of uh, fledgings at the front of the arrow, and you basically have to shoot into the wind. So it, there's so much drag on the front of the arrow that you shoot into the wind, and it, it basically flips around and comes on the other side. You can't control it. That's the thing. So if you know someone's around the corner at this exact same spot, um, or not around the corner, but if someone is like behind a tree and they're exactly, say, three meters behind the tree, then you could pull it off. But remember, it's the same problem as having throwing knives. A knife rotates at a certain uh, frequency. So if you're not standing at a very specific spot, the knife will hit your handle first, right? And the same thing with the, um, the, the arrow. If you're any further away than that particular spot, then it's not going to work very well. That's why um, I find that some of the trick shots that he should produce so is, is a bit disingenuous. They're impressive, but it's kind of like instead of um, controlling the arrow to hit an obstacle with things in the way, you know where it will fly, so you place the obstacle where it avoids. That's, that's a slight camera trick. Now, I'm not saying Lars does this, but for someone like me who can learn to do it, I can pretend to be a trick shot master by um, not doing it live. If someone changes things, then I'm not going to do it. That's why the um, the, like I, I know people are up in arms about the uh, the fact that he uses um, real people like kids at, as um, as props for his tricks. Um, he knows it's safe because if he misjudges the shot, it actually flies away from them. Um, so he he knows that the arrow will come around a certain way. Therefore, he can put any object, whether it's an animal or a living person and the arrow won't go there because he's using the right technique for that particular distance. Um, not saying you should do it, but it's actually not as useful. And plus, you know, the more it moves away from the center line of the shot, the more energy it loses. You can't kill someone from bending arrow. That's what people always misconstrue about this. And it's not his fault, necessarily. He's not saying that you can kill people. He's saying that historically people can do this, which is true. And the, the, the records show that people can do this or could do this. It's in the manuals. Um, it's the more trick shooting manuals, but they're still in the manuals nonetheless. But people keep saying these are techniques used in battle. No, they weren't. All right, uh, that's my little. Uh, that's my last rant. My only one for this video. Well, that that's the uh, that that's the, the question there. Okay, um, so back to Sebastian. Uh, thanks for the channel. Maybe do a test training with the local club, and after that, I joined and just ordered my first bow. 
Well done. That's right. It's really good to go and try new things. I, I don't care whether you shoot Olympic style or traditional style. Doing archery is a new activity. I, I was just talking to one of my ex-students at school. He came back. He graduated like a couple of years ago. And he's the sort of person who is kind of floating around. He doesn't really have a goal in life. He just does things. And he didn't want to join a club. He didn't want to do anything new. He just wants to hang out and um, watch TV or play games. There's no motivation. And it was so hard to get him to say, look, try something new because he's he has he's kind of like uh, I wouldn't say autistic, but he has a lot of social issues. Um, so he, he he can't interact with people very well. But it's a, if you don't go out and try new things, you're in a dead end. You don't expand your skill set. It's hard to be employed because you have no outside experience. And personally, having mentored a, a future teacher who um, had that, that lifestyle, who did, who did nothing with their life. Um, it was so difficult to work with. That's something I might talk about a different time uh, because this, this, is, this is a professional issue. I'm a teacher by profession and I mentor teachers, like new teachers and up-and-coming teachers. And most people are okay, but some people have serious div- development issues like as a person that prevent them from doing their job properly. Mm. Sorry, I'm, I've been drinking this um, this little milkshake thing here, right? And uh, it's 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 a, it's a Snickers kind of like a blended shake, and the the peanuts getting stuck in my throat, so I need to clear that out a bit. All right, uh, back to the questions. Um, undo BMF. If you use a release date with a recurve bow, will the shooter be more accurate? Generally, yes. Um, a release date will remove on the biggest variables, and that is the finger release. Um, you can still have problems with the release aid, of course, but the fingers, like a, rele- a mechanical release aid, is far more consistent than a finger shooter. That said, doesn't mean you're automatically good. Um, one of the funny things is recently at the uh, at our club championship, uh, one of our new members, he's a kid, he's, he's, he's in my live stream a few times, if you're watching, hi, um, but uh, like he was shooting a compound of the release aid, and he was going toe to toe with me, and he was really happy that he was, you know, competing against me because I'm I'm new sensei. I shoot recurve, I shoot Olympic recurve. He's shooting inside the compound. He should like beat me with his eyes closed. Um, so it doesn't make you a great shooter. So the fact that I was I'm out of practice, but I have more experience, um, I outshot him with his compound, and I use a recurve. It doesn't make you automatically good. Um, there are problems in that though. The biggest problem is you can't hold a full draw. That's actually really, really hard. Uh, the compounds can do it because they have a let off. So you can hold a full draw and then just squeeze the trigger and let it go um, naturally. Whereas with a recurve, you're under a lot of pressure to release sooner rather than later. It's much harder to shoot with a, um, a release aid with a recurve. Um, Let's see, the, do the pattern on veins count as camo? Um, as I mentioned before, it may. But depends. I, I, this is something you don't normally see in competition. Um, like I said before, the, 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 the line between the intent of the pattern. If it's a camouflage pattern, sure. If it's an artistic pattern, that's a bit more ambiguous. I, I think Tiger Stripe is a, 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 a bard where you have like lines on your veins. They should be okay. I mean, like, for example, if your feathers have like black splotches, then that shouldn't be considered camouflage. That's not um, the intent of it. Um, let's see. When is biohome? I don't know. I don't, I don't know what biohome you have. Um, Horovac. I spent today filming arrows flying off in order to, in order to determine if my plunge is set up properly, how far should protrude, how much tension, how it went right. That is one, the, the plunger tuning is very fine and sensitive. I actually can't tell you right now because there are so many things to look for. Um, you need to do a bear shaft tune. So not analyze just the um the arrow, but do a bear shaft tune as well. You can fix most of your problems through draw weight. Um and cutting the spine of your arrow. The plunger is for things like the angle of the uh the arrow. How far it should shouldn't be more than like half an inch away from the center line pointing away. Uh, and you might also have to do a clearance test. So what you can do is put like um, baby powder on your arrow uh, or on the um, the uh, the shelf or the rest and the plunger. Um, shoot the arrow and see where the arrow makes contact. Um, if there's any contact, and very often with an arrow that is slightly um, too stiff, 
um, the back of the arrow will make contact with the rest or the plunger on the way out. And if there's any mark there, especially even if you see like streaks from your veins, that's a big hint that the arrow isn't well uh, matched, and that may mean it had to do some extra tuning for your plunger button. Um, let's see. Oh, I think we're done, right? Oh, hang on. I, I scrolled the bottom there. Um, uh, I've missed something, haven't I? Tag me in your name. I can see I'm talking to. You. Um. Okay, uh, left foot. Okay, this is a rather left foot question. What makes you prefer War Thunder among all other war gaming? Such as what uh, War of Two Tanks. Okay, um, this is a gaming question. I don't mind. These, I don't mind these questions. Um, I used to play a lot of World of Tanks at the time. World of Tanks was um, like the only tank game. Um, I, I'm I'm a history buff, so I love World War Two history. Uh, I'm not really a tank person, but yeah, I play a lot of the World War Two games. You have like um, the Region Medal of Honor, especially Frontline Allied Assault. Those were fantastic games back then. Um, and then you had called the first few Call of Duties before Call of Duty became you know a franchise as it is now. Um, and World of Tanks was basically a tank game where you can blow tanks up, and I really enjoyed World of Tanks. Um, and I played that for a couple of years. Really enjoyed it. And eventually I stopped playing. I played the, the French tanks, got up to the AMX 120. Sorry, the, um, what am I thinking of? AMX 120, yeah. Um, and afterwards I stopped, I stopped playing that um, much, uh, if, if, if anything else, really. Um, why War Thunder? Because War Thunder has uh, penetration modeling. Um, World of Tanks at the time was cutting edge because it modeled penetration, like it, it modeled physics. And basically it means that you can angle your tank and improve your armor, um, shells will behave a certain way. But basically, World of Tanks is a game of numbers. It's very arcade. You have hit points, okay? Um, at the time, if you shot towards the center of an ammo rack, there's a chance it'll blow up. And there was some, there's a certain satisfaction in doing so. But you see that, especially in high level play, people will basically exploit the game's mechanics. So, for example, you would shoot at the front axle, the front wheel, so you would track the vehicle and damage it with the penetration. And it becomes more of like knowing how to hit like really tiny weak spots rather than the spirit of tank battles, which is um, tactics and penetration. Uh, War Thunder has a more dynamic model where once the shell penetrates, it does different things based on where you hit. So instead of hitting like the commander's cupola or the um, you know this one tiny spot and do like 500 damage per shot, um, if you hit that one weak spot, it might do nothing because there's nothing there. Whereas you have to aim for an ammo rack, you have to aim for a crew compartment, and the fact you have one hit kills on a regular basis is a very fun thing. That's why I like War Thunder more than World of Tanks. Uh, I like the arcade mode because it has that World of Tanks speed, but with the War Thunder damage model which i like more that's why i like war thunder a bit more um I, i've played world of warships not really my thing i don't like war thunder navy either. it doesn't look appealing to me this is, it seems quite broken in beta right now um but world of warships for me i got i got bored of it it's, it's a pretty cool thing um but again a lot of people are trying try to min max i don't like how you can buy things which give you advantages um, you know, things like you have 5% extra um, uh, accuracy or 5% um, dispersion or something. I, I don't like these things. Like, if I, if I customize a tank, I want it to look cosmetic. I want to put things to make it look pretty, but not I have to put something to give me an advantage. It's why, like, things like Call of Duty don't appeal to me more. Um, back in my day, we played online for fun, not because um, you can um, grind to have a 1% advantage. And this is why, following the recent things like Battlefront 2 or UFC 3, that looks so bad because you're, you're paying for advantages, and that's not what a game should be. All right. Whoa, that was a uh, quite a long question there, but yeah, that that was um a nice left field question. There. I I don't really play that much anymore, but yeah, it's more like the immersion of like I can sit down, shoot one shell, and destroy something confidently, uh, rather than random number generator. Oh, and Jesus is not your thing. Uh, let's see where we're we talking about. Hmm. Did I, did I see a question here? Uh, I might have missed a question somewhere. Just tag my names. You can repeat the question. Um, 
One rare fusion again. Now, which one make it actually more marketable or appealing to companies as their pro staff? Results and medals or image and public relations skill? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, that, that, that's my question of the night, so thank you, uh, Rare Feason. Um, so, what makes an archer marketable? Is it skill or is it public image? Skill. It is results. Sponsors will look for results. And one way to get sponsorships, one way is to basically win things. The more things you win, the more likely you are that people who are sponsoring the event or scouting the event will sponsor you. Um, when, uh, when, uh, for, for pro staff, for things like companies and shops, um, they will basically either approach you or they open applications. Now, for certain things which are more casual companies, then it's easy to do. For example, um, uh, I used to write for Archery Target Archery Magazine, which is now Archery Extra, and they, they uh, every year they have uh, they select some pro staff, and they normally pick like um, young up and coming archers or veterans who have a lot to share. So basically, you have to provide like a resume. So basically, how many things you competed in, how many things you've won. If you've won, say, you know, uh, the June division of a field event, uh, you've won um, like five tournaments, then you're more likely to be chosen. So the first criteria is uh, is results. Skill is, is it fluctuates, but it's the results. Medals, trophies, and high rankings will give you more visibility in the sponsor vision. So more sponsors will um, put feelers out to you if you're a good performing archer. Public image alone is not a factor. It might be the tilt factor. Uh, it might be the, the the make or break for certain things. Um, I was looking at uh, the Pat Archery um, Pro Star application uh, a few days ago, and it said that very specifically, what you do in social media is going to be a strong influence. So if you are a, a, a troll and you swear a lot and you have this negative image, they will consider you. You might be the most skilled shooter, but you represent their business as a pro staff shooter. So if you're a dick, then you're not going to be accepted. Even though you might be the number one ranked person in Australia, you still might be the number one dick in Australia. <laughs> so to put it shortly, uh, to put it bluntly, the companies will look for people who are um, who are skilled and have results first. Uh, public image and value community is not a strong factor, but it might be a secondary factor if you're shortlisting people. So you have, say, it, two people who have equally good results, uh, but one person is generally more respected in the community, they'll probably get that person. But let's say, for example, there's like, you know, the number one person in Australia, and then there's me, who's like the number 100th or something, then they'll probably get the number one shooter, because that person will get results. I'm just a person making Facebook posts. So um, it suits their brand more to have a skilled, high-performing archer rather than someone who is a community participant. So um, that's a very good question. But yeah, marketability is about results. It's not about PR. PR is something which not many people are very good at. Um, that's why you see a lot of athletes who are very skilled, get paid millions for their skills in whatever sport they play, but they do stupid things on Twitter. So, there we go. Um, let's see. And that's all the questions. All right, so that's basically an hour and a bit. So, uh, if, if you're still around, thank you for joining me for this stream. I uh, will be doing the Ask Me Anything uh, Q&A in around uh, eight hours from now. So if you're still around, then uh, feel free to join me then. Um, I'll be happy to take on the archery questions as well as any other questions you have um, for me regarding anything else. So um, if you're into archery or gaming or teaching in general, then feel free to uh, ask me questions there. Hopefully, I'll see you around. Uh, I reckon we'll stop it here. That's been a nice discussion on cam firstly camouflage and secondly the other things too. Always fun to hang out with you guys. This is New Sensei. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.